In this lecture, we'll be looking at reactive and proactive control of gait. At issue in this lecture is how gait is effectively adapted in the face of changing task and environmental conditions. We will see that adapting gait involves modulating the strategies used to accomplish both progression and postural control. Adapting the strategy used for, for progression can simply mean modifying the strategy used for generating propulsive forces. We looked at an example of this last lecture when we looked at gait kinetics. We saw that propulsion from torque can be generated by either a pull from in front via knee flexion or a push from behind via ankle plantar flexion. Adapting the strategy used for maintaining the upright posture of the body during locomotion can involve both reactive and proactive balance strategies. Let's begin today by looking at reactive balance control during gait. Nashner developed an experimental protocol for studying reactions to unanticipated perturbations. In this research, participants were aligned so that their third and fourth comfortable steps would have them stepping on special platforms. These platforms created a variety of perturbations to balance. This included longitudinally translating the foot with a range of plus and minus eight centimeters, translating the foot upwards or downwards with a range of plus or five centimeters of platform movement, and dorsiflexing or plantar flexing the ankle joint with a range of platform motion of about plus or minus five degrees. As we will see later when we talk about anticipatory balance, knowing that a perturbation is coming will affect how the, uh, your reactions to the perturbation are going to be organized. To counter this influence, participants knew a perturbation was possible, but not on which trial it would occur, and, uh, and they didn't know what type of perturbation could occur. What we're doing in this research is attempting to understand what happens when a slip of some kind occurs. Let's look at some of the results of this study. Here we have a situation where the participant steps on the platform and the platform is translated backwards. This backwards surface translation pitches the body forwards. This perturbation pulls the foot backwards and causes the gastrocnemius to be stretched faster than usual. The reactive response to this stretch is a muscle response in the gastrocnemius with about a hundred millisecond latency. This response moves the center of pressure anteriorly to slow the forward pitching of the body. In this next situation, when the participant steps on the platform, the platform is translated anteriorly. This pitches the body backwards. As the planted foot is pulled forward by this perturbation, the tibialis anterior is shortened more slowly than it, than it usually would be. That is, it shortens more slowly compared to how it would shorten if the foot were not sliding out from beneath you. The response to this slowed shortening is activation of the tibialis anterior with a latency of about 100 milliseconds. This response moves, moves the center of pressure backwards anteriorly to slow the backward pitching of the body. An important characteristic of the reactive postural adjustments that we've just been looking at is that they are integrated appropriately into the gait cycle. By this I mean that they are organized to be functional responses. To understand this point, let's look at what happens when we experimentally manipulate when the perturbation is occurring within the step cycle. Here we see the different moments during stance at which the perturbation was made in this research. It is important to note that the orientation of the limb changes systematically as we go from perturbing the stance limb during loading response in condition number one to perturbing the stance limb during terminal stance in condition number four. To understand the findings of this research, we will focus on the situation where the platform pull, pulls the planted foot anteriorly and the body consequently pitches forwards. 
before we look at the pa uh, at the patterns of ga gastrocnemius and tibialis anterior recruitment that were observed in this in the study let's think about what we would expect for uh, uh, expect them to be in order for them to be functional Let's begin by considering what the effect of gastrocnemius activity should be as a function of when the perturbation occurs. If the body is pitching forwards, then we require a response that will generate a force that counteracts that motion of the centre of mass. If the perturbation occurs during loading response or during mid-stance, that is, in conditions 1, 2, or 3, the resulting plantar flexion torque will move the centre of pressure out in front of the centre of mass, and a force will be generated that counteracts the forward fall of the body. In contrast, if the gastrocnemius is activated during terminal stance, when the stance foot is behind the centre of mass, the plantar flexion torque will act to accelerate the forward motion of the body and therefore exacerbate the perturbation. In simple terms, we see that activation of the gastrocnemius in a reactive response is only functional in certain parts of the step cycle. Next, let's think about the recruitment of the tibialis anterior. The effect of tibialis anterior recruitment is to move the centre of pressure anteriorly. In this situation, when the body is pitching forwards, moving the centre of pressure backwards will accelerate the forward motion of the body. Thus the effect of the tibialis anterior would be to exacerbate this perturbation in all four postures. Here we see the actual response amplitudes for the gastrocnemius. As we would expect, based upon assuming that the responses we're going to observe are going to be organised functionally, we see that gastrocnemius responses are maximal when the activity is functional, and minimal when the responses are dysfunctional. Similarly, given that the activation of the tibialis anterior is dysfunctional in all conditions, we see that the response amplitudes of this particular muscle are minimal in all conditions. To better understand the organisation of reactive balance responses, let's look at a study by Tang and colleagues. In this study, the researchers simulated the conditions of a forward slip by having a floor plate that shifted forwards 10 centimetres at a rate of 40 centimetres a second. They recorded the activity of multiple muscles during the, during the ensuing slips. To, to minimise the ability of participants to anticipate when a slip would occur, perturbations only occurred in some trials. The participants knew a perturbation was possible, but not upon which trial it would occur. Tang and colleagues observed that patterns of muscle recruitment during the slip were ordered distally to proximally. Were ordered distally to proximally. Here we see the muscle recruitment pattern for the contralateral limb, that is the limb that remained on firm ground while the other limb slipped out. The black arrow in this figure marks the moment of platform motion onset relative to the moment of right heel strike that, 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 that occurs right at the beginning of the figure. On this colour-coded figure, we see that the most distal muscles are being, recorded, are, are being recruited first. When we look at muscle activation patterns for the ipsilateral limb, we see a similar pattern. Of note, these findings have been, uh, found, uh, have been found to apply to both proactive balance as well as to reactive balance that we're looking at here. Now that we have a sense of the relative timing of muscle activations, what's the magnitude of muscle activations? Tang and colleagues observe that the magnitude of postural muscle activity in reactive balance is four to nine times that of the activity of normal walking. They measured EMG activity as a multiple of normal walking activity levels. For example, here we see that the activity of the ipsilateral rectus abdominis was 7.7 .7 times the level of activity that's observed in that same muscle during normal unperturbed walking. As we've discussed previously, there is significant variability in the muscles that get recruited. 
Given this variability, Tang and colleagues analyzed the frequency with which particular muscles were observed to be, rec be, to be recruited. They observed that postural muscle activity occurred more frequently in distal mus uh, muscles than in proximal muscles. Or phrased slightly differently, that, po there was, that postural muscle activity observed more reliably in distal muscles than in proximal muscles. Frequency of postural muscle recruitment was measured as the frequency of muscle activity occurrences, where an occurrence was defined as muscle activity that exceeded, exceeded one standard deviation above the ensemble average for non-perturbed gait. Here we see that the distal muscles were nearly always recruited, and more proximal muscles were less reliably recruited. Recruitment of the rectus abdominis is likely to vary with changes in trunk posture at the moment that the perturbation is, is occurring. We've just looked at reactions to slips. Let's now look at strategies for recovering balance from trips. First, we'll look at trips that occur late in the swing phase. In this research, participants walk across a level floor, and trip events are studied using a hidden bar that flips up to produce a tripping hazard that, could, that can catch the swing limb. A commonly observed response to this type of trip is a lowering strategy. Here we see the basic kinematics of the lowering strategy. We see the swing limb in red and the moment of the trip labelled with the blue arrow. The essence of, the, of this strategy is that following contact with the obstacle, the swing limb immediately reaches down to the floor. The function of this strategy is to quickly create a new base of support. Here we see the hip, knee and ankle kinematics associated with the strategy. The solid red line shows the swing limb kinematics of normal gait. The dashed line shows the kinematics of the lowering strategy. After the moment of the trip, what we see is that the swing limb is rapidly reaching down to the ground. The most reliable muscle activity observed in the lowering strategy is activation of the biceps femoris, as well as inhibition of the vastus lateralis. The activation of the biceps femoris creates a knee flexion torque that acts to arrest the forward progression of the limb. The inhibition of the vastus lateralis minimizes knee extension torque and avoids counteracting the action or the action of the biceps femoris. Now let's look at trips that result from the swing limb getting caught early in the swing phase. As before, trip events are created using a hidden bar that flips up, producing a tripping hazard that catches the, catches the foot of the swing limb. A commonly observed response to this type of trip is an elevating strategy. Here we see the basic kinematics of the elevating strategy, and we see the swing limb in red. The essence of this, of this elevating strategy is that following contact with the obstacle, the swing limb immediately lifts itself up and over the obstacle. The function of this strategy is to rapidly extend the base of support uh, to extend the base of support beyond the obstacle. At this point in the kinematics, what we're seeing is that the swing limb flexor torques are acting to lift the foot up, uh, up and away from the obstacle before accelerating the limb forwards to clear the obstacle. This movement is about avoiding the obstacle on the ground. In this strategy, we also see the st we also see stance limb extensor torques. This generates early, uh, an early heel off that raises up the body and further raises up the swing limb to help it avoid the obstacle and to uh, and to clear the obstacle. Here we see the hip, knee, and ankle kinematics of the swing limb associated with the elevating strategy. We see flexion of the hip and the knee acting to raise up the limb, and ankle, ankle dorsiflexion to move the toes uh, uh, up away from the ground. Schillings and colleagues studied how the choice of a trip recovery strategy varies as a function of the timing of the perturbation. 
Participants walked on a treadmill wearing special goggles that obscured their view of the treadmill in front of them and as well as uh, and their view of a metal plate that could be released onto the treadmill and cause a tripping hazard. The experimenters varied the timing of the release of the obstacle. What Schillings and colleagues observed was that an elevating strategy was used for early swing phase trips, whereas a lowering strategy was used for late swing phase trips. They also observed that both strategies were used in the case of mid swing phase trips. To understand why we tend to see an elevating strategy used as a response for a trip occurring early in swing phase, and a lowering strategy used as a response to a trip occurring late in swing phase, we need to look at how strategy effectiveness varied as a function of the timing of the trip. Here we see the kinematics of an elevating strategy being used as a response to an early swing phase trip. In these kinematics, we can see that this strategy is effective at maintaining the upright posture of the body. Here we see the kinematics that are associated with using an elevating strategy as a response to a late swing phase trip. We can see that this strategy is ineffective in maintaining the upright posture of the body. When used as a response to a late swing phase trip, the elevating strategy exacerbates the perturbation and is likely to destabilize the posture by uncontrollably pitching the body forwards. Let's look at some recordings of a participant using a lowering strategy and an elevating strategy. In this first video, we can see the lowering strategy being employed. It's quite subtle, but pay attention to what happens as the foot strikes the obstacle. At the moment of the foot strike, we can see that the foot rapidly drops down to the ground to touch the ground in front of the obstacle, thus quickly creating a new base of support. Here we see the elevating strategy being employed on the right. You will notice that the foot collides with the obstacle but rather than reaching down as, in, as is done in the lowering strategy to make contact with the ground, the foot is instead lifted up and over the obstacle. We have been focusing on reactive balance strategies. Let's transition to looking at proactive balance. Here we see another experimental setup where researchers are creating a slipping hazard in the environment. In the setup, part of the floor is placed on rollers, such that when you step on it, it shifts out, uh, out in front of you. In the first trial in this research, participants had no experience of the, this particular slip event. Their response on this trial was primarily reactive rather than proactive. The initial reactive response on this first trial involves a rapidly activated flexor synergy that's used to stabilize the posture of the, the posture of the body uh, against the shifting movement of the ground. It also involved an arm uh, an arm elevation as a strategy for moving the center of mass of the body to stabilize balance, and it also in involved a modified swing limb trajectory. As soon as the first trial has occurred, the participant now has a history of experience with the slip event. This experience allows them to proactively plan a balanced response strategy. On these trials, a much modified strategy is observed. The observed proactive balance strategy involves a more flat-footed landing, where the foot plants itself onto the sliding surface. It also involves the center of mass being shifted over the base of support provided by the planted foot. This strategy is, in effect, a surfing strategy, where the body is postured to be able to glide forwards on the sliding surface. The basic take-home message here is that when a perturbation to balance is repeatedly experienced and can be anticipated, it's possible to organize and continue to refine a response that is adapted to the characteristics of that perturbation. 
when we're talking about proactive balance, it's useful to distinguish prediction-based control strategies and visually activated control strategies. Prediction-based control strategies act to minimize the destabilizing forces arising from our own movements. For example, heel strike generates a posture destabilizing braking force that pitches the head, arms, and trunk forwards. When we look at muscle recruitment patterns, we see that the gluteus maximus is recru recruited in anticipation of the perturbation to balance in order to proactively stabilize the posture of the upper body. Visually activated control strategies involve modifications to gait that are made in anticipation of upcoming potential threats to balance in the environment. To really understand the role of visually activated control in mobility, we need to study gait in cluttered environments. Patler and colleagues studied participants walking through novel environments that forced them to alter step length, to alter their direction of progression, and that forced them to have to step over obstacles. To understand how vision is used, the experimenters had participants wear special shutter goggles. These goggles are designed so that you can only see out of them if you press a button. The experimenters instructed the participants to move around the novel environments and to only open the shutters on the goggles when it felt like they really needed vision. The results of this study are quite surprising. Participants successfully and effectively traversed the cluttered environments with only intermittent visual information about the novel upcoming paths. Specifically, they found it was possible for subjects to safely navigate the environments by only opening the shutter goggles 50% of the time. The researchers found that the participants needed to open the sh shutter goggles for longer periods of time when bigger adjustments to gait were needed. For example, when ga gait needed to be ad adapted to obstacles or a, or a turn needed to be made. The main takeaway of this research is that vision has a highly specific role in the control of locomotion, or in simple terms, vision is only needed at certain times. Laurent and Thompson studied a task where there were targets on the ground and participants had to adapt their walking so they ended up stepping on those targets. This task was designed to be analogous to the real-world -world task of seeing upcoming terrain variations uh, in, the, in the path in front of you and adapting your gait to d deal with those variations. Visually guided adjustments to gait parameters in Thompson and Laurent's, uh, Laurent's study were observed as early as three to four steps ahead and were spread out over the remaining steps. We know that vision is used for adapting gait to variations in terrain. What then is the visual information that's util utilized to cross complex terrains? A series of studies by Aftab Patler have shown that during walking, action relevant information is detected by briefly fixating obstacles and targets. On the left, we see the uneven terrain that participants tra traversed in this research. On the right, we can see the participants' view of the terrain, and in this image, the red circle shows where the, the participants' gaze was directed. This is measured with an eye tracking system. The researchers observed that participants frequently looked in front of them at a distance of about two step lengths. Recently, researchers have studied where people look on the ground when they're traversing rugged natural terrains. We can see three different environments depicted here that were investigated in this research. Flat terrain, medium terrain, and rough terrain. This research uses a special bodysuit worn by participant that, participants that measures how a person is moving through the environment. It also uses an eye tracking system to, work, to measure where people are looking. Here we can see the combination of bodysuit data and eye tracking data. We can see where people have been looking on the ground with the heat map. The parts of the ground colored in purple have not been looked at, 
and the parts in the ground coloured in red have been looked at a lot. The large red area under the, under the, under the participant's foot in the, in the diagram shows an area that the participant had been looking at and is now standing on. This is likely to be a part of the ground that offered, offered a solid foothold. Here we see a graph of look-ahead time. The x-axis is the number of seconds between the participant looking at a particular location on the ground and the participant arriving at that location. The y-axis shows how frequently different times of look how how frequently different look-ahead times were observed. The different lines on the graph show show the data for walking on the flat terrain in green, medium terrain in orange, and rough terrain in blue. Based upon this graph, we can see that participants frequently looked at parts of the environment that, were, that they were likely to be stepping on in 1.5 seconds. On the past two slides, we've been considering the role of vision in the control of locomotion by measuring where people were looking. This research is telling us about the role of foveal vision. Now let's look at some research that reveals the role of peripheral vision. In this experiment, participants walked on a treadmill. They were required to constantly look at an object on the ground in front of it that was on the ground in front of the treadmill. The experimenters dropped metal plates onto the treadmill. Given that participants had to look beyond these plates at all times, it meant that these, ob the, that these obstacles could only be seen using peripheral vision. The results of, the re of this research were, were, were as follows. Using only peripheral vision, participants were able to detect the obstacles dropping, and they were able to adapt their gait to allow them to step over the obstacle. The lesson here is that peripheral vision is sufficient for unpredictable obstacle avoid avoidance. This means that it's not necessary for a person to directly look at each part of the environment that requires a gate adaptation. Locomotion over uneven terrain is costly, both in terms of the attention that's required to detect information about the terrain, and in terms of the extra energy that must be expended to constantly adjust gait to the environment. Volushina and Ferris investigated the energetic cost of walking on uneven, on uneven terrain by using an uneven surface treadmill. They studied walking and running. In both cases, they found that average step parameters on the uneven surface treadmill surface were not different to those observed on a regular treadmill. They found that mean muscle activity was increased, that muscle activity variability was increased, and that muscle coactivation and muscle stiffness was increased. When participants walked on the uneven surface of the uneven surface treadmill, their energy expenditure went up by 27%. When participants ran on the, the uneven surface of the uneven surface treadmill, their energy expenditure went up by only 5%. Let's now progress from talking about uneven terrain to talking about adapting gait to significant physical obstacles. In this experiment by Aftab Patla, participants walked down a pathway until they encountered an obstacle, at which point they either had to go over the obstacle or go around the obstacle. Going over or going around constitute two different modes of action. Across trials in this experiment, Patla manipulated the height of the obstacle. The key takeaway from this research was that the selection of an action mode was not based upon the absolute height of the obstacle. Instead, selection of whether to go over or go around depended upon the relationship between the height of the obstacle scaled to the length of the shank of the participant that was approaching the obstacle. Here we see the data for different participants in the study. On the x-axis, we see the relationship between the height of the obstacle and the height of the lower leg. A value of 1 means that the height of the obstacle was the same as the length of the shank. 
A value of 0.5 means that the height of the obstacle was half the length of the lower leg. We see that when the bar is white, participants are selecting to go over the obstacle, and that they do this when shank length is less than obstacle height. When obstacle height is larger than shank length, we see that participants are nearly always selecting to walk around the obstacle. The making of a choice here is related to the concept of affordances. When a person approaches the obstacle, they need to perceive the possibilities for action. In other words, they need to be able to perceive whether they can step over or whether they should walk around. Let's now look at the kinematics associated with stepping over obstacles. Specifically, let's focus on toe clearance. Given that catching your toe on an obstacle can create a significant perturbation to balance, it's important to have a toe clearance that's large enough to provide a safety margin that reduces the risk of tripping. Here we can see the kinematics of the trailing limb. The green arrow points to the trajectory of the tip of the toe where no obstacle was, is present. We see that the toe stays quite close to the ground. The red arrow points to the trajectory of the tip of the toe when an obstacle is present. What counts as toe clearance here is the shortest distance between the toe and the obstacle throughout its trajectory. Here we see the kinematics of the leading limb. Again, the trajectory of the tip of the, to tip of the toe in the obstacle crossing condition is shown with the red arrow. And as before, toe clearance is measured as the shortest distance between the toe and the obstacle throughout the trajectory. So here we see the results of this study. On the y-axis we have toe clearance, and on the x-axis we have the different obstacle heights that were studied. The grey bars show the toe clearance for the leading limb, and the black bars show the toe clearance for the trailing limb. We can see that the toe clearance is often between 8 and 12 centimetres. We also see that the leading limb often has a large clearance, a larger clearance than the trailing limb. Next, let's, let's look at toe clearance variability. Here we see that the leading limb has less variability. This means that the leading limb toe clearance is more consistent over trials. So why would we expect to see larger trial-to-trial -trial changes in toe clearance for the trailing limb compa uh, in comparison to the leading limb? There's two possible explanations here. First, if the toe of the leading limb catches the obstacle, this will create a much more challenging perturbation to balance compared to catching the toe of the trailing limb on the obstacle. Second, the trailing limb can be <coughs> second, the trailing limb can be seen. This means that the leading limb can benefit from visual information to help regulate its path relative to the obstacle. This additional informa information uh, will decrease the variability of the movement. Stepping over higher obstacles presents a greater risk of tripping and leads to a reduced rate of travel. Because of this, we see that people will select alternative action modes and will walk around the obstacle when it starts to get too high. What we're seeing here is that people can perceive the challenges posed by a particular object and will adjust their mode of action accordingly. In other words, people are able to perceive the possibilities for action or affordance properties of the environment and adapt their locomotion accordingly. Another example of an affordance property is the possibility of breaking an obstacle if it's stepped upon. If we ask people to step over a breakable object, we see that their toe clearance is, uh, their toe clearance is increased. We've just looked at how gait is adapted to terrain and how gait is adapted to obstacles. Let's now look at how gait is adapted to changes in surface conditions. In this experiment by Cham and Redfern, the experiment has manipulated the incline of the surface that participants walked on, and how slippery the inclined surface would be. In a dry floor condition, the floor was not slippery. In the water-covered floor condition, the ground was somewhat slippery, and in the soap and oil-covered conditions, the floor was very slippery. Here we see the apparatus that was used. 
Notice that we have a force plate on the ramp so that we can study the ground reaction forces that are used in the different conditions. The experiment had baseline trials, anticipation trials, and recovery trials. In the baseline trials, participants were certain that the floor was dry and therefore not slippery. In the anticipation trials, slipperiness was manipulated, and, and participants were told that there could be a contaminant on the floor making it more slippery. Lastly, in the recovery trials, participants were told again that the floor would be dry and therefore would not be slippery. When participants step on the force plate as they walk up the ramp, we can measure the forces that the foot is exerting on the ground. The important con components here are the normal ground reaction force, which is the force that is perpendicular to the surface, and the shear ground reaction force. The shear ground reaction force is the force that's generated by the foot pushing forwards when it lands. Surface conditions are significant for locomotion because changes in the slipperiness of a surface will determine what shear forces are possible before the foot slips out. The implication here is that gait must be modified to suit the possibilities for stable locomotion offered by a particular surface. Let's look at the results of the study. In the anticipation trial, trials where surface slipperiness was manipulated, there was a 17 to 40 percent reduction in the peak shear ground reaction force compared to the baseline. There was also a 2 to 13 percent reduction in the peak normal ground reaction force compared to baseline. What we're seeing here is that the participants are modifying the forces that, that, um, that are being exerted on the ground when they believe that the surface could be slippery. To achieve this, participants are coming up with a compensating strategy in which stance duration was reduced, loading speed was reduced, stride length is reduced, and the angle between the foot and the platform is reduced at the moment of the heel strike. We just looked at how gait was adapted to minimize the risk of slipping on the surface. We saw that the participant had shorter steps, that they were more flat-footed in placing their foot onto the surface, and that they were more gently lowering the weight of the body onto the ground. These gait modifications were performed in order to minimize a slip. To understand these, these modifications, we need to understand what causes a slip. So how do we capture the potential for slipping on a given surface? Here we see the basic physics of the situation. Most importantly, in blue, we see that the friction force depends upon mu multiplied by n, where mu symbolizes the coefficient of friction and n symbol symbolizes the normal ground reaction force. As you might remember from our biomechanics class, a slip will occur when shear force is greater than, the fri uh, than friction force. The friction force depends upon the normal ground reaction force. To capture slip potential, we can measure the ratio of shear force to normal ground reaction force. If this value is greater than 1, then a slip will occur. If it's less than 1, then a slip will not occur. Cham and Redfern measured the maximum or peak value of shear force divided by normal ground reaction force. In the anticipation trials, they observed a 16 to 33% reduction in this value compared to baseline. What we're seeing then is that gait adaptations are acting to reduce the risk of a, of a slip. The last aspect of this research to consider is the difference between the anticipation and recovery trials. In the anticipation trials, participants knew there was a possibility that the floor could be slippery. And in the recovery trials, participants were assured by the experimenters that the floor was dry and not slippery. Here we see the data comparing the anticipation trials in the black bars to the recovery trials in the grey bars. On the y-axis we have the different ramp inclines that were studied, and on the y-axis we have the amount of reduction in the peak value of shear force divided by normal ground reaction force, compared to baseline. 
the larger this value is, the greater the degree to which a participant has, adap has adapted their gait in order to reduce their risk of tripping, sorry, their risk of, of slipping. The first thing to notice in the graph is that the characteristics of gait do not return to normal in the recovery trials. Rather than returning to the baseline levels, which will be at zero, the participants are still adapting their gait in a way that will protect them from slips to a greater degree. In the anticipation trials, the participants seem to be le learning that the ramp is a place that could be slippery, and that, knowledge, and, and that knowledge is carried into the recovery phase, even though the participants are told that the floor would be dry again. In other words, the participants are learning the affordances of a particular place. Another important surface characteristic for the control of, control of gait is surface compliance. Ferris and colleagues manipulated surface compliance by changing the number of rubber mats that were run across. This manipulation is changing how stiff the surface is. Here we see a diagram showing the lowering and raising of the center of mass between initial contact and takeoff. We see that the hip, knee and ankle become flexed and the center of mass moves downwards, converting the gravitational potential energy of the body into elastic potential energy in the muscles and tendons. This stored energy is then released to aid in the propulsion of the body upwards and forwards. When we run on a surface that's compliant, the give in the surface has the potential to interfere with the ability to store and release energy. Here we see how participants adapted their gait when running on surfaces with different stiffnesses. In the graph, we have the stiffness of the surface on the x-axis and the stiffness of the stance leg on the y-axis. The graph shows us that when surfaces were less stiff, or more compliant, that leg stiffness was increased. Here we have a plot of surface stiffness on the y-axis versus displacement of the center of mass on the y-axis. We see that the line for each participant is mostly flat. This means that the movement of the center of mass was kept the same across the variations in surface stiffness. This shows us that the changes in muscle stiffness that we're seeing in the graph on the left help keep the same degree of center of mass displacement and maintain an efficient exchange of gravitational potential energy and elastic strain energy. In short, we see that participants adjusted muscle stiffness in order to compensate for the characteristics of the surface that they were running across. Not much is known about the specific mechanisms that are used to adjust muscle stiffness in response to changes in, the, in surface properties. Research by Stein suggests that proprioceptive feedback may be an important factor in stiffness modulation. And animal studies have revealed that leg stiffness adjustments can occur within one step of moving onto a new terrain. So far, we've looked at how steady-state gait is adapted to changes in the environment. Another key part of, adapted gait, of adaptive gait is the ability to change the direction of progression. Hayes and Stein studied turning behaviours. Their research revealed two distinct strategies. The first strategy was a spin turn. In the diagram here, we can see that a spin turn to the right involves planting the right foot on the ground and pivoting the body on that foot. The second strategy is the step turn. Here we see a step turn to the right. This involves turning on the left foot. Here, rather than the left foot swinging all the way around as it does with the spin turn, the left foot is planted in front of the right foot, and then this allow then, and then, then this then allows the right foot to be unloaded and to be pivoted. The takeaways from this research are as follows: generally, the leg that's placed forwards to produce the braking force. To stop the walker to, to step the forward to stop the forward progression was used as the axial leg for rotating the body. Next, a step turn is thought to be easier to perform and more stable. 
This is because the base of support during the step is wider, and the two feet are on the ground at the same time for a longer proportion of the turn. Next, most of the young healthy subjects in this, in this research were able to complete the turn without the need to reset the walking rhythm. The last thing I want to, to cover today is another funda fundamental form of gait adaptation. Here we're looking at how gait is initiated. In other words, how we transition from a quiet standing stance to steady state gait. To do this, we're going to look at the trajectory of the center of pressure during a gait initiation. Here we see the feet in contact with the ground during quiet stance. The black line shows the trajectory of the center of pressure during gait initiation. The stance limb is on the left, and the swing limb that will be initially stepping forwards to initiate gait is on the right. As we move from point one to point two, we see that the center of pressure moves towards the swing limb. This is associated with bearing more weight upon the, sp uh, upon the swing limb. We then see the center of pressure move under the stance limb. Here we're seeing this person pushing off of the swing limb in order to load the stance limb. During this phase, we're also likely to see hip and knee flexion of the swing limb in anticipation of the limb being lifted up. By the time we reach point three, we've reached swing limb toe off and the swing limb is in the air. As the center of pressure migrates anteriorly under the stance foot, the swing limb is progressing through the air. When the center of pressure arrives at point four, under the ball of the stance foot, the heel of the swing limb is striking the ground. At this point, the heel of the stance limb is elevated up off of the ground. At point five, the center of pressure moves to the end of the foot, and we have stance limb toe off. To further understand this movement, we can look at the associated muscle activity patterns. Initially, we see that the uh, that anterior leg and thigh muscles are activated to stabilize against backward sway. Next, as the center of pressure moves forwards, um, uh, moves forwards up the stance foot, we see that the tibialis anterior is being activated, starting to dorsiflex the stance limb. We see hip, uh, hip abductors being activated to counter the drop of the pelvis as the swing limb is unloaded. And we see the perineals being activated to stabilize the stance ankle. Lastly, we see the gastroc and hamstrings activated to propel the body forwards. That wraps, that wraps up this lecture. In the next and final lecture in this part of the class, We'll be, we'll be reviewing the perceptual and cognitive factors that impact mobility.